The second story is about democratizing access to human movement analysis. And there are many talented individuals involved in this, both at Stanford and at the Gillette Children's Hospital. We couldn't have done it without the collaboration between Stanford and, and Gillette, and I particularly wanted to thank Mike Swartz at Gillette for just years of collaborating with us. Now, traditional gait analysis takes place in a lab and requires a significant amount of time and expensive equipment. With optical motion capture, you need specialized cameras, you need trained individuals, and they have to place the markers on the subject. The subject has to come to the lab where they move in a way that might not be how they move at their home or in their community. Once the data is collected, a significant amount of time is required to manually segment it, input anthropometric measurements. It's quite a process. Also, trained individuals have to then read the data, gain some insights, and produce a report. Now, these are incredibly valuable reports, but the extensive resources required to collect the data and analyze the data really limits the number of individuals we can have in research studies and, and in clinical gait analysis. It's really only available to a small number of patients. But this is a major problem. Many patients around the world just don't have access to state-of-the-art biomechanical analysis. So a new approach is needed. Using commodity cameras like those you'd have in a smartphone with a powerful complement um, to the traditional gait analysis approach. So we don't see this as replacing traditional gait analysis, but we see it as a complement. I'll show you some of the results that we've developed so far where a subject can be recorded nearly anywhere in the world with a smartphone camera and then leverage modern computer vision algorithms like those in open pose. And what you'll see is that open pose does pretty well but it's not good enough for really biomechanics research or clinical insights. But we can add to that a neural network that improves the accuracy with which we can assess biomechanics with a smartphone camera. So the outputs of open pose go to the inputs of a neural network and that automatically generates uh, ideas for a variable of interest. So we've trained a neural network using a database of videos and corresponding optical motion capture for children with cerebral palsy. And in particular, we sought to answer the following questions. Can a deep neural network predict common gate metrics from 3D gate analysis from just 2D videos? Can we predict change in gate metrics over time? And can we even predict who is gonna get surgery? So we trained a machine learning model using a data set with videos and optical motion capture from over a thousand children with cerebral palsy. We used only the sagittal plane video. These data collected were uh, a part of a normal gait analysis over a 20 year period at the Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare Center. So while the capture protocols were somewhat standardized, the equipment used and the lab setting varied substantially over this 20 year period. Now we used open pose to extract key points. Open pose gives you 25 key points from the video, things like the center of the ankle, center of the hip, center of the knee, of the wrist for both left and right sides. And as you can see, it works pretty well. When I see these things and I think about it, it does make me reflect back to Moybridge where he was doing a get grid background to take metrics from simple video. And when I started in biomechanics, this is how we used to do it. We would film and hand digitize spots and now it's fantastic. We can go back to film and, and have that done automatically. So how did we do with the, the open pose and neural network? We did pretty well. So first, remember, we're trying to predict key gait metrics. And what I'm plotting here is the knee flexion angle at maximum knee extension. 
And we care about this because many children with cerebral palsy walk in a crouched gait pattern. So they're walking with flexed knees, and we want to know how flexed the knees are. So what I'm plotting here on the x-axis here is the predicted knee flexion from the video and the neural net, and the true knee flexion angle that is from the 3D motion capture. And each data point is an individual subject. With just the raw open pose, we got a correlation of 0.5. With the neural net and open pose, however, we did much better, a correlation of 0.83. So quite helpful. Now, it's not as good as the 3D motion capture, but imagine if you have a kid who has cerebral palsy, it's so hard to do now. You just go into the lab maybe once in their life or maybe once before and after surgery. Here, if you could do it with a smartphone video, that you could just take the video once a week, submit it to a website, and get this variable of interest that you care about. We also looked at gait deviation index, and here you see a correlation of 0.75, a little bit lower than the prediction for knee flexion angle, but we don't expect perfect correlation. So um, still quite high considering that we only used a single plane video and the fact that the key points came from open pose models that were not really trained uh, perfectly. So can we predict change over time? Here again, we did quite well. The correlation is 0.83. What I'm plotting is the, the change in degrees that is predicted versus the true change. And we see a, a quite a nice correlation. So we're getting quite good predictions in our model. Now this could be helpful if you want to see if, for example, your child with cerebral palsy, if their knee flexion angle is getting worse over time and you take them once a week or once a month for a year, and you say, wow, their knee flexion is getting more, their crouch is getting worse. This could be uh, quite a helpful input. Can we predict who's going to get surgery? Now, I don't think it's, we're at the point in time where we would plan surgery with a smartphone, but it could be a nice screening tool with our convolutional neural network it matched or even slightly outperformed a model of GDI from uh, the gait deviation index from optical motion capture with an area under the curve of 0.71, suggesting its potential utility as a screening tool. We have made all of these tools freely available. You can give it a try. You can upload a video of your gait. You can see what your gait deviation index is. We're also interested in having people use this in their own research for different clinical populations. For example, if you're at a children's hospital and you want to check to see if you can predict from your videos the gait deviation index and the knee flexion angle, you're welcome to just upload your videos, give it a try, and you'll get your answers in a matter of seconds. If people want to try this for different applications, like the knee adduction moment I showed you in the last story, our tools are available and adaptable. We want to make this available to the community. The vision is that rather than have biomechanical studies that analyze subjects with maybe just 10 individuals, we could have hundreds or even thousands of individuals in biomechanical studies in the future. So just a summary of some of the key takeaways. Machine learning models can predict quantitative gait metrics using a single play-in video. Our workflow is available and could be applicable to many other populations and metrics. Please feel free to give it a try. It's available freely to all. Our vision is to turn smartphones into pocket-sized biomechanics lab that provide free access and large-scale interventions across the world. So that's democratizing intervention. I now want to move on to the third story about biomechanics at planetary scale.